The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 1257 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on hate crimes against Polish migrants. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Kenneth Gibson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would first like to thank all those SNP, Green and Labour members who signed the motion so that we could have this debate on a topic that is so relevant and important at this time. And I'm disappointed that none of the 31 Tory or five Lib Dem MSPs felt able to support it. Hate crimes of any type directed at any group of people should never be tolerated in our society. It has sadly transpired in recent months that a number of people find it acceptable to act out their dangerous and prejudicial views. As the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance has pointed out, there has been a rise in recent years of alleged attacks on Muslims, whilst anti-Semitism reached record levels for the UK only two years ago. But the focus of hate crimes in recent months has been on East Europeans, who appear now to be bearing the brunt of them, particularly our largest and most visible East European community, the Poles as Polish migrants in particular have suffered at the hands of bigots. Only a few short weeks ago, a Polish migrant lost his life allegedly, allegedly due solely to his ethnicity. As that case is subjudice, I cannot refer to it specifically today. However, I'm sure all our hearts go out to the family of the individual concerned. There are more Polish nationals in Scotland than any other group from outside the British Isles, and our two countries share a deep, rich history that has been important for both nations. These links go as far back to at least the 1400s when trade agreements between Aberdeen and the old Hanseatic seaport of Danzig, now known as Gdansk, were signed. It's thought that around 30,000 Scots migrated to Poland over the following 250 years as they embraced these new opportunities. Scots integrated well, completely into Poland and often acquired great wealth. The relationship between the two nations was greatly strengthened by prosperity as numerous Scots contributed to the growth of charitable institutions in a new home while still supporting their roots back in Scotland. Robert Gordon University, as it is known today, is a famous example, originally a hospital built by Aberdonian Robert Gordon himself, who earned his money in trading, trading in Danzig. It was not until the Second World War, however, that there was a reciprocal arrival of Poles to Scotland. The two countries became more deeply intertwined as they fought a common enemy. And in Ayrshire, there's a plaque on the Polish monument in Prestwick to commemorate their service personnel who died in the Battle of the Atlantic. The majority of Polish soldiers based in the UK during the war were stationed in Scotland. And Wells Hill Cemetery in Perthshire is the largest of the many burial grounds in Scotland where Polish soldiers are laid to rest. After the war, even stronger connections were drawn between Scotland and Poland as many Poles chose to stay on and it is estimated that around 2,500 Polish-Scottish marriages took place in the immediate post-war period. These fruitful links between our two countries continue to this day and must be protected. These range from the informal twinning arrangements between Krakow and Edinburgh to steps taken by local councils to welcome Polish migrants, such as offering English language lessons on both a one-to-one -one basis as well as through colleges and learning centres. The Polish community brings much to Scotland, more often than people realise. The national records of Scotland show that 86% of people of Polish ethnicity are economically active, and in the UK that rises to 92%, making them the most economically active group in the country and significantly above Scotland and the UK as a whole. Similar figures can be found in terms of education, with Poles in Scotland having a considerably higher than average level of qualification. Indeed, 41% of the Poles in Scotland are educated to degree level or higher, compared to 22% for those who define themselves as white Scottish. And the work ethic of the Polish community is renowned, and I've had personal experience of that, presiding officer. Many Poles came to Scotland during the recession and struggled to find an appropriate job despite qualifications. Polish migrants have therefore taken roles in many areas of society, particularly services, agriculture, construction and business, and boosted the Scottish economy with their skills and hard-working attitude. The fact that people chose to choose Scotland as their country they wish to call home is something we should be extremely pr proud of. The Polish community has brought so much to Scotland and should not suffer assault or insecurity that the recent surge in reported hate crimes has caused in other parts of the UK. Sadly, this is a matter that goes further than simply the Polish community. And in recent months, hate crimes against migrants from all areas have risen, and reports of hate crimes increased by 42% in the week before, and a similar figure in the week after the EU referendum. 
And studies show that only around one in four hate crimes are reported to police, and so the real figure is likely to be significantly higher. A large part of this rise is undoubtedly due to poisonous and irresponsible reporting by certain sections of the media. Patients at risk from EU doctors screamed a front page headline by a particularly xenophobic newspaper only 10 days ago. It has sadly become the case that a small minority of indi individuals seem to believe that the result of the EU referendum is a license to behave in a racist and discriminatory way. We must ensure that Scotland's reputation as an open, accepting and tolerant country continues. There is no room for complacency regarding potential attacks on our neighbours, no matter who they are and where they come from. In the aftermath of the EU referendum, it is more important than ever that this reputation endures and that Scotland's and indeed the UK's message of welcome continues. No one should be made to feel uncomfortable and unwelcome in the country they have chosen to call home. There is no place for prejudice or any kind of intolerance, be it racial, religious, sexual or any other kind. Recorded crime is at a 42 year low and our country is an increasingly safer place to live. We must therefore work even harder to ensure intolerance of any form is not accepted. And the latest social attitude surveys give cause for hope. But while it appears that Scotland has experienced nowhere near the spike in hate crime seen in England over the summer, one hate crime is one too many. And it is a duty of us all, both in the Parliament and Scotland as a whole, to condemn these acts of hatred and bigotry and do all that we can to protect and welcome all who choose to live their lives here. Presiding officer, in times like this, solidarity is more important than ever. Scotland stands by the people of Poland and will continue to welcome and support our Polish community in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Stewart, to be followed by Ivan McKee. Mr Stewart, four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I first of all start by echoing the comments from made by Kenna Gibson this afternoon uh, in securing the debate on this important issue. Such crimes of hate that are perpetrated against those people from Poland who have made their home in Scotland and the United Kingdom must be categorically condemned in the strongest terms. There has been a long tradition of migration from Poland to Scotland and the United Kingdom. Poland played a crucial, crucial role in the Second World War. The Poles were Allies' fourth largest force and helped secure essential victories against acts uh, and ensured that victory came. The United Kingdom has a long history of our Polish friends. Between 1930 and 1940, over 100,000 people from Poland settled in the United Kingdom. Moreover, in 1947, the House of Parliament passed the Polish Resettlement Act, which recognised the outstanding contribution of Poles that were made in the war and offered British citizenship to over 200,000 Polish troops who had been displaced by the conflict. Many of the Polish migrants found a new employment in Britain and played a vital role in re-establishing uh, from the Second World War. And Mr Gibson talked about Wells Hill Cemetery. Well, it was my honour and privilege to be the councillor for Wells Hill from 1999 until 2007, until my ward was enlarged to Perth South. And for the last 18 years, I have attended ceremonies at that. And I look forward to, on the 6th of November, laying a wreath on behalf of the Scottish Parliament at that cemetery. Today, Polish migrants continue to engage fully in British society and in our economy. As is mentioned, 92% uh, of working age Poles live in the United Kingdom, have either higher education or employment, a level much higher than the average uh, person within the population. In the terms of character and work ethic, these individuals from Poland have a huge contribution to make to our society. They participate, Deputy Presiding Officer, they engage and they become pillars of the establishment within any community that they represent and they live in. And that has to be welcomed. There is no doubt that hate crimes against anyone in this country, wherever they are born here or they have chosen to live here, is totally and utterly unacceptable. It is my great belief that the perpetrators of such crimes are very limited and on the fringe, Deputy Presiding Officer, of society. And the vast majority of people in Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom recognise the information and the opportunity that Polish people have brought into our country and continue to do that. We must uh, at all times uh, ensure that we do ensure that any perpetrator is challenged, is subjected to the law and is punished because we cannot allow information of that nature to go out. You've commented, Mr Gibson, about the media and the media have a role to play very much in this process. Uh, uh, the media have had a role to play in migration through the centuries and generations, uh, but even more so today uh, and the, the social media that we have, which instantly makes things happen across a network uh, and things can go viral, can without question and 
without doubt create a big information as we move forward. In concluding, presiding officer, uh, it is uh, all of us in this chamber must condemn these acts and make it clear that the true values of inclusion and acceptance is what we in this country hold dear and send a strong message across from this chamber and outside that this behaviour must not be tolerated in any shape, way or form. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Ive McKee to be followed by Mary Fee. Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, and I thank Kenny Gibson for bringing this motion to the Parliament and for allowing us the opportunity to speak on this important issue. As uh, Kenny said, the links between Scotland and Poland are long and deep. In the 16th and 17th centuries, well-established transport links existed across the northern Baltic seas, offering opportunities for trade and migration in both directions. A sizeable Scottish community grew up in Poland. By 1650, up to 40,000 Scots were living across the country, working as everything from travelling peddlers to officers in the Polish army. Indeed, Alexander Chalmers served as Mayor of Warsaw in the 1690s. Many maintained links back to their homeland, then, of course, an independent Scotland. Many settled and intermarried with the local population, and these family ties occurred at all levels in society, perhaps none more famous than the marriage of the old pretender James Francis Edward Stuart to Maria Sobieska, the granddaughter of one of Poland's most famous kings, Jan Sobieski. Yes, indeed, Bonnie Plunge Charlie was a Pole. The late 19th century saw the wave of immigration from Poland, known as Zaklebem, for bread, escaping the starvation levels of poverty in a Poland, which had by that time lost its independence. Many reached the USA, making Chicago the largest Polish city outside of Poland. France was another popular destination. Mariana Brzezinska from the district of Łódź, my great-grandmother, found herself at age 14 in the melting pot of cultures that was Glasgow at the turn of the 20th century. Another wave of Polish immigrants arrived in Scotland during the Second World War. The Polish club in Glasgow is named after Władysław Sikorski, Prime Minister of the Polish government in exile during those dark years in Polish and European history. The immense contribution of the Polish Air Force pilots in the Battle of Britain is well documented. The adaptability of language plays an intriguing role in the integration process. I first met the great Scots language enthusiast and historian Billy Kay in a restaurant in Warsaw. Billy was on a tour of Polish universities lecturing on the historical links between Scotland and Poland and promoting his fine book about the diaspora, the Scottish world. Billy spoke of the history of Polish name places adapted from the original Scots names given to them by the 17th century Scottish founders. And in, interestingly, in my own constituency recently, I noticed a couple of Polish surnames. Perhaps a spelling mistake, or maybe a creeping Caledonianisation. Matsulevich, simply by capitalising the U, transforms into Mikulovic. And Matskoviak, similarly to Makkoviak. And this is a process that works well in reverse. McKee is read in the Polish language as Mitske, a small step to Mitskevich, surname of Poland's greatest national poet. And so to the most recent wave of Polish arrivals to Scottish shores, with budget airlines rather than steamships now the transport of choice. Many have been here since Poland joined the EU in 2004 and are well integrated with children born in Scotland, contributing immensely to Scotland, its economy and its culture. Many, my own wife included, have married Scots. Others are even more recent arrivals, still baffled by the unpredictability of the Scottish weather. However, recent Polish, however, recently Polish friends in Warsaw brought my attention to an incident that had occurred in Edinburgh, reported in the Polish press of a Polish family living in our capital city being the victims of racial abuse and vandalism. An unacceptable situation and unfortunately part of a recent trend and one that we all must take steps to eradicate. We welcome all from wherever they come to contribute to the complex tartan that is modern Scotland. We do so sadly in a Europe that is unfortunately witnessing growing and dangerous levels of intolerance and xenophobia. Both Scottish and Polish societies need to be open to those of all faiths, colours and creeds. Tolerance is a two-way street. Some 50 years ago, a politician stood in solidarity with a people and said, ich bin, ich bin ein Berliner. Today, I want to send a message from this parliament, the Scottish parliament across this country and beyond. We should say, yes, this me Paul Kami. We are all Poles. The Tami Viscotze, welcome to Scotland. Thank you very much. I call Mary Fee to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms Fee. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I apologise at the start for my croaking My throat? goodness. <laughs> We're all going to have to listen. Take, take your time. <laughs> can I start by thanking Kenny Gibson for tabling this motion and for the work he's done in raising awareness of the rise in hate crimes against the Polish community in Scotland. And it is sadly the case that here in Scotland, as well as across the rest of the UK, we have witnessed a rise in hate crimes motivated by race since Britain's vote to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June, particularly aimed at Polish migrants. And it has been acknowledged by many prominent politicians and journalists that the rhetoric of the Leave campaign during the EU referendum was divisive and dangerous. And in the aftermath of that referendum result in the summer, the former government minister, Baroness Farsai, described elements of the Leave campaign as divisive and xenophobic. And Baroness Varsai was correct then, and that remark still stands correct now. The Leave campaign was divisive and xenophobic. It was a campaign designed to scare people, divide, communi divide communities, and scapegoat European migrants as the root of all the problems that we face across the UK. And rhetoric like this is dangerous and divisive as it simplifies the very many complex issues that we face as a nation by scapegoating European migrants for all of these problems. And Scotland should lead the UK by ensuring that we are a modern, tolerant and inclusive nation which accepts people of all race, religion and nationality. Polish nationals in Scotland should feel safe safe from threats, safe from abuse, and safe from attack. And the motion for this evening's debate makes reference to Scotland and Poland's historic and strong relationship. The importance of the historic links between Scotland and Poland stretch back, as we've already heard, as far as the 15th century and cannot be understated. In the late 15th century, trade agreements were agreed between Aberdeen and the former, former Baltic seaport of Danzig, now modern-day Gdansk, a city which I was happy to visit over the summer months. And in the 250 years that followed, more than 30,000 Scots moved and settled in Poland. And later in the 17th century, the Aberdonian merchant Robert Gordon would make his wealth from trading out of Danzig and settling in the city. In the early 20th century, after the fall of Poland to Nazi Germany, around 38,000 Polish soldiers came to be stationed in Scotland and took over the coastal defence of Fife and Angus as they were unable to return to occupied Poland. And in 2016 Scotland, the links between Scotland and Poland are still as strong as ever and Polish nationals continue to contribute to the diverse and rich fabric of our society. Recent figures from the National Records of Scotland highlight the considerable contribution that the 55,000 plus Polish diaspora in Scotland are making to modern Scottish economy, 600 years after the first Polish-Scottish trade links were established. And finally, presiding officer, it's crucial that we unite against the dangerous rhetoric which aims to divide our society with xenophobic scaremongering. We must challenge, condemn and report all hate crime if we witness it. And Scotland has to lead the way within the UK by ensuring that Polish nationals who choose to make Scotland their home always feel welcome, always feel safe and always feel appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand you have to leave early. Perhaps for a lie down in a gargle would be a good idea. Uh, I now call um, Annie Wells to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We all agree in the Chamber today that hate crimes in Scotland and the wider UK should always be condemned and that we should do our utmost to make sure that everyone living in this country feels welcome. I am proud that this country is one where we tolerate one another's beliefs and actively celebrate our diversity in a way that strengthens our society. 
Scotland and Poland share a rich history, as we've heard already, and it is estimated that nearly 80,000 Polish people were living in Scotland. In Glasgow alone, over 8,000 people identified themselves as Polish in the 2011 census. And I would like to also add that my great-grandfather was Polish and came to Scotland at the start of the, the, the last century as a navvy helping to build Scotland's railway. And I do support the sentiments, uh, sentiments of this motion wholeheartedly. The referendum, however, has left us in a position where we have to increase our efforts to make sure that we come together as a nation and make sure that we curb the worrying increase in racist and xenophobic acts. I was shocked to see incidents of neo-Nazi stickers going up around Glasgow during the summer, and I was shocked to learn about the worrying increase of hate crime in the wider UK, including an incident where a Polish community centre was vandalised with graffiti in Hammersmith. The vote on the EU, an exercise in democracy, must not be turned into something contemptible and racist, and I am pleased in Scotland that this has largely been seen as the case. More generally, the proportion of char charges that specifically relate to racially aggravated harassment and behaviour in Scotland has fallen over recent years by over 15 per cent since 2008. Police Scotland reported that it has not seen an increase in the number of crimes reported over the referendum. These must be reassuring, reassuring figures indeed. Whilst this is very positive, I do of course acknowledge that 14 per cent increase in the number of hate crimes across the UK as a whole, crimes which affect not just the Polish community. I do not condone this and it concerns me as much as it would any other member in this chamber today. It is more than unfortunate that the increase is linked with our exit from the EU, but I am also reassured that the UK Government is taking decisive action to tackle the rise in hate crimes. The Government's new Hate Crime Action Plan has been implemented in England and Wales this summer, a plan that will increase the number reporting of hate crimes, prevent hate crimes on transport and provide stronger support for victims. In addition to this, £2.4 million of funding will be made available to places of worship for extra help with security and installing equipment for mosques, synagogues and other religious institutions which need extra protection. The Government will also continue to develop the Fund, and na fund National Projects True Vision and Tell Mama, initiatives set up to raise awareness of hate crimes and encourage victims to, to report them. In Scotland and closer to home, I welcome, I welcome Glasgow's involvement in this month in the National Initiative Hate Crime Awareness Week, a week in which there will be a host of events taking place to raise awareness about hate crime, how to respond to it, and encourage victims and witnesses to report it. Initiatives such as these, to me, show that ultimately the UK is an inclusive and tolerant country and one that celebrates diversity. If we, can, if we stand together, we can work to stamp out the racism that exists at the periphery and make all communities living here feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by John Finney. And Mr Finney, we'll be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me start by uh, thanking Kenny Gibson, uh, as others have done, for giving us the opportunity to uh, have this uh, particular debate. Uh, when I was uh, a minister in the Scottish Government, uh, I found myself very regularly uh, representing the UK uh, in discussions uh, with Polish ministers. I'm never quite sure why that was the case. Perhaps they simply recognised the natural affinity that we Scots uh, have with uh, so many people uh, in Poland. Uh, for my personal part, uh, I first became aware of the Poles uh, through a friendship with my, the person who became my patrol leader when I was the Boy Scouts. That was Zbigniew Clement Skrudzki. Uh, he was uh, a result of one of the 200,000 marriages when Janet Barclay married, uh, married Captain Stanislaw uh, Skrodzki of the Polish cavalry, uh, Spignev and his sister Felicia uh, were the uh, result. Uh, Bush, because that is the nickname by which people who are called Spignev are pretty universally known in Poland, uh, was a terrific character, uh, much admired by my friends, uh, perhaps envied uh, for the fact that he had a Vincent Black Shadow motorcycle and many of the tales we could uh, uh, have of Bush. 
But Bush continued uh, the record of service that there was uh, across the Polish community uh, to Scotland and to the UK. Uh, Bush himself uh, followed uh, in the steps of many Poles who came to fight against the Nazis uh, after the war. And indeed, it's, uh, it's worth uh, making the point that uh, Polish squadrons, of which there were four based in Scotland, uh, had a strike rate against the enemy, which was two and a half times greater than pilots uh, in indigenous squadrons. Uh, but Bush joined the Royal Naval Air Service, and uh, perhaps not surprisingly to us, uh, Bush uh, uh, managed to have three crashes in his first four years there. Unfortunately, the last of them uh, was fatal. And we still miss Bush uh, to this day. Uh, but he is just one of many uh, Poles who've contributed enormously uh, to our community. And of course, the history of the connections between Scotland and Poland are very significant. To this day, there are many towns and cities in Poland that have parts of their city called the uh, Nova Scotia, New Scotland. Gdansk also has somewhere called Stary Scotia, Old Scotland. Uh, Warsaw has a similar place. Uh, and Krakow, which of course used to be the capital of Poland, uh, similarly has a new Scotland. So the links between us go deep and they long, uh, they've been long established. Indeed, in 1585, the Polish-Lithuanian King Stephen Bartory uh, said, our court cannot be without them. They supply us with all that is necessary, They're them being the Scots, and said, let there be a certain district assigned to them. So the Scots were singled out uh, in the 1500s for their contribution uh, to Polish life. Uh, we also uh, know, presiding officer, uh, that uh, today the Poles are contributing enormously. In my constituency, each of the four secondary schools have Polish as one of the language that is represented in the people who go to these schools. And at a local college whose graduation ceremony uh, I attended only on Saturday, there were a significant number of people from Poland who were making the most of their potential and graduating uh, from that college. Let me just uh, close by perhaps addressing the more fundamental issue that's brought us here, and that is the ill treatment and racism which too many of our Polish friends have been subjected to. Uh, Robert Kennedy, a uh, well-known United States uh, politician said, when you teach that those who differ from you threaten your freedom or your job or your family, then you also learn to confront others not as fellow citizens but enemies to be met not with cooperation, but with conquest, to be subjected and mastered. He was correct, and he was also correct in saying that is unacceptable in a civilized society. Tonight we unite to send a message to our Polish friends, we are with you, stay with us. Thank you, John Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to add my congratulations to uh, Kenny Gibson for bringing this highly pertinent debate to Parliament. Um, uh, it's an ugly term, hate crimes, but it graphic illustrates, I, I think, if I noted Kenny correct, as saying acting out dangerous and prejudicial views. And that we must, and I'm delighted to hear the unanimity across the, the chamber about how we address that. Now, I'm not going to rehearse all the historic references that have been made there, that they're well established. Certainly, the Second World War re uh, references uh, resonated with me because of the affection my my father and his brothers would have had for the Polish people who, who uh, joined in the fight against fascism. And we know that there were 16,000 families settled in the UK at the end of that war, uh, and they contributed greatly to us. And who were these people? Well, these people were the parents of classmates, and similarly, they were joined by many people, certainly from Peram and Lechaber, uh, from the Baltic states as well. And the, the, the recent immigration to Scotland and the UK, 7% um, of the Scotland's population Born out, out with the UK, Poland, uh, I think this is uh, pertinent, Poland became a member of the EU in May 2004, and it's estimated that 44,000 Polish migrate each year to the UK, and that was the case between uh, 2004 and 12, when the figures were uh, available. Um, and as has been said, the largest, majority, the largest group of individuals born out with the UK and Scotland are Polish residents. And, 
That it was interesting to hear um, from uh, a professor of Polish studies at the University College London, Anne White, who talked about the pattern of Polish migration to the UK tends to be migration of young families rather than young single migrants who return to Scotland after several years. Uh, many parents move to uh, the UK for a year or two before bringing over their children. And as we know, many Polish migrants start their own business after a few years. She writes, and I think this is very significant, there's now a generation of Poles at home in the UK. And there's certainly a great number at home in the Highlands and Islands, and long may that be the case. Um, people have talked about the contribution that you, EU migrants have made to the UK economy. The figures I have here for 2000 to 2011, 20 billion, 20 billion the contribution. And EU migrants, 43% less likely to be in receipt of benefits, 7% less likely to live in social housing than UK born. And as has been quoted earlier, um, more highly educated. Um, now, I think there's some d d disturbing figures in a poll taken in 2015 in advance of the, the referendum. 23% of polls felt they'd experienced discrimination. 23% uh, of that number felt in more than one occasion, and there is obviously under-reporting. There's also the issue of workplace issues around fees for uh, um, uh, retaliation and victimisation and fees that prevented people taking their employment cases there. Um, Kenny Gibson talked about poisonous reporting and the, the motion talks about irresponsible and shameful reporting and um, I would take issue with my Conservative colleague. I don't think that was on the fringe and I would ask to what end. We've all seen the collages of lurid headlines from the Express and the Mail. Now I don't doubt for one second that these pass some legal test but they don't pass a moral test and they certainly mm -hmm. cause me yeah. great offence. And it certainly doesn't offend Mr Dyker the owner of the Daily Mail sufficiently, the EU doesn't offend him that it stopped him claiming a quarter of a million pounds in EU funds for his sporting estates. Yeah. Um, so the EU referendum was characterised, in my view, by lies, distortion and threats. Uh, um, Racism re requires to be challenged at all times. We've heard about the stickers that have gone up. We need to challenge graffiti. I th think we need to be cautious not to be complacent about how, where we sit in Scotland. The far right is on the rise across Europe, and Scotland's no different. As I said by many previous speakers, I stand in solidarity with the Polish people. I stand in solidarity with all people, in fact. And uh, to, to all of them, I'd say, Falcio Ledunia, you're all very welcome. One partisan point, the Green uh, campaign, European campaign, had a, a, a tagline, which I'm sure everyone would, would now subscribe to, and that is a just and welcome, welcoming Scotland. But I would add to that a safe and secure Scotland for our Polish uh, residents. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call on Alistair Allen to close for the government. Minister, seven minutes, please. Presiding officer, uh, can I firstly commend Mr Gibson for bringing an extremely important issue to the floor of Parliament and creating a welcome opportunity to talk about the important role of the Polish community in Scotland. And indeed, uh, as he mentioned, the very long history uh, of Scots who have settled in Poland, a point also made uh, by Mr McKee and many others. As a nation, Scotland has a long history of welcoming people of all nationalities and faiths and of supporting their integration into the Scottish community. This is a two-way street because those who choose to make Scotland their home help to influence their own culture and for the better. And so it is with the Polish community who have chosen to make Scotland their home. There are over 61,000 Polish people living in Scotland Scotland has a close and enduring partnership and relationship with the Polish people and the Polish nation. We have strong cultural and historic links, as demonstrated recently when our governments worked together to support the Wojtek the Bear Memorial. This now stands proudly in Princess Street Gardens as a symbol of the enduring friendship between our nations. And that memorial, of course, provides an opportunity too to remember with respect all those Poles who fought to ensure our own freedom during World War II, uh, as Mr Stewart uh, and Mr Stevenson uh, and others have rightly alluded to. So let me be clear when I say to all Polish people here and indeed anyone else who has come from elsewhere in the EU to make Scotland their home, Scotland is your home. Uh, you are welcome here and we appreciate your contribution. Indeed, Scotland would take a different approach to the issue of migration if we had the powers to do so. The relentless focus of the UK government on reducing net migration, irrespective of the value that migrants bring to our country, is, in my view, harming Scotland's economic prospects. In Scotland, we welcome our important established migrant populations 
and the contribution they are making to our economy and our society. Now, the outcome of the EU referendum has caused understandable anxiety within the Polish community, and I deeply regret that. Almost immediately following the vote, I took the time to visit local Polish com communities and businesses in Edinburgh, and indeed to meet Poles in my own constituency, and I'm sure other members did likewise, to hear their concerns and to seek to offer reassurances. And this work continues. My ministerial colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities, will attend the unveiling of the Panels of History and Sacrifice in Glasgow's Polish House this weekend. We remain, presiding officer, committed to engaging with Scotland's Polish community to hear their concerns and to understand their priorities. But the reality is that even despite the UK Prime Minister's speech this weekend, we do not yet know what Brexit means. It is a disgrace that the UK government has not yet guaranteed the position of EU citizens. And I repeat again my call on the UK government to do the right thing and stop using human beings as bargaining chips. And to add to that, we have seen in other parts of the UK a sharp increase in reported incidents of hate crime against ethnic minority groups, including, very sadly, Polish people. We have seen, as Ms. Wells mentioned, reports of a Polish cultural centre in London daubed in graffiti and the toxic debate around immigration that so dominated the EU debate in parts seems to have created an environment where some feel it is acceptable to show prejudice and target others on the basis of their nationality. Indeed, the recent report of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination held that the, and I quote, campaign was marked by divisive anti-immigrant and xenophobic rhetoric and that many politicians, many politicians, and prominent political figures not only failed to condemn it, but also created and entrenched prejudices, thereby emboldening individuals to carry out acts of intimidation and hate towards ethnic or ethno-religious minority communities and people who are visibly different. The committee also noted that the surge in hate crime was absent in Scotland. Now, I think that demonstrates that despite political differences, the debate in Scotland was conducted in a different way. But like Mr Finney, I don't say that to be complacent, nor can we pretend that the toxic debate from elsewhere has not impacted either on EU nationals living here or indeed on, on the views of those in Scotland who still believe it is acceptable uh, to be prejudiced. We will continue to work with Police Scotland and others to monitor the situation closely and we will continue to engage with the Polish community on their concerns and issues. So I encourage anyone who feels they have been the victim of hate crime to report it to Police Scotland. They take all such reports very seriously and will, condu will conduct thorough investigations to ensure perpetrators are brought to justice. Presiding officer, we have published a race equality framework which will run until 2030 to take a long-term approach towards improving outcomes for Scotland's minor minority ethnic communities. We will shortly announce the appointment of a race equality framework advisor to help drive that work forward. Our independent advisory group on hate, crime, prejudice and community cohesion has published its findings and we will consider these carefully in informing our future work in this area. And through our Scottish approach to building community cohesion, we are focused uh, on ensuring that fundamental principles of social justice, human rights and an inclusive national identity are woven throughout everything that we as a government do. So let me be clear, presiding officer, there is absolutely no place for bigotry and prejudice in Scotland. The Scottish Government is committed to tackling hate crime and we will continue to work with communities, not least the Polish community, to create a Scotland which celebrates diversity and creates equality of opportunity for everyone. Thank you. That concludes the debate. I now close this meeting.